Okay, hello and welcome to this Institute for Government event. Uh, my name is Tom Sass. I'm an associate director at IFG and I lead our work on policy making. So I'm really delighted to welcome you all here today for what promises to be a very timely discussion. Uh, everywhere you look at the moment, there are rather depressing stories about the worsening state of our country's health. So we read about record levels of diabetes, increasing long-term uh, illness, and stalling life expectancy. Uh, colleagues at the IFG have set out that the, uh, that the NHS is already, uh, by any measure, in crisis, uh, and our health and our health care risk sort of entering a downward spiral. Uh, Andy Haldane said recently that for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, health factors are a serious economic headwind, shrinking the labour force and stalling productivity. But if that all sounds too gloomy, uh, there is also increasing focus on how to turn this around, even if no party yet perhaps has a compelling plan. Uh, you increasingly hear the argument in Parliament, uh, including from Lord Bethel, who's here, that health equals wealth, uh, and there's a lively debate in policy circles about where to focus. Uh, today, we're adding our own contribution to that with a new report on where government efforts to tackle obesity have gone wrong. And this is the first in a series we're going to be doing on chronic policy areas where successive governments have struggled to make progress. So on the panel, we're going to be discussing why obesity is a chronic issue in the UK, how governments have tried to address it, uh, and what they need to do differently. Uh, and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to do that. Henry Dimbleby on the left is co-founder of Leon and of course the author of the Michael Gove commissioned national food strategy. He was lead non-executive director at DEFRA uh, before re resigning in March, partly over a lack of government action on this topic. Uh, and he has a new book out called Ravenous, how to get ourselves and our planet in shape, which I think you can buy uh, outside here today. Uh, Sophie Metcalf uh, is researcher at the Institute for Government and the lead author of our report, uh, which we're publishing today and we'll be running through the findings. And Dr. Dolly Tice is a vis visiting researcher at Cambridge University, the author of a brilliant uh, study on obesity policy in England. Uh, Dolly also worked on public health policy at the Centre for Social Justice and as a researcher in the House of Lords. Uh, and I should add that given the report says it's been somewhat difficult to find MPs sometimes to talk on this subject, we did invite several, but unfortunately none were available to join us. Um, so how this is going to work, I'm going to ask uh, some questions of the panel, but then we'll have plenty of time for questions from you too. Those in the room can just raise your hand and, and say where you're from. Uh, those online can start submitting them on Slido and we'll get through as many as possible. You can use the hashtag IFG obesity strategy. So Henry, I was going to start with you. Uh, your new book provides a great primer on this topic. Why do you think diet related ill health uh, is such a big problem in the UK? Well, I think it's worth, I think there, there are two questions. Why is it such a big problem in the Western world? And then why, uh, why is the UK world leading in terms of uh, diet-related disease, only second only really to, to the US and Canada? And the reason and we, in, in the book that it is uh, a problem worldwide is because the way in which people understand the system working, which is that if you are overweight, then it is because you are lazy, you don't have enough willpower, and you're not exercising enough. All of those things are provably wrong, and yet, you know, in the focus group work we did and the quant work we did for the food strategy, everyone, particularly those who are suffering, blames themselves. And the real reason is what we call the junk food cycle. So you have first to recognise that the appetite is incredibly powerful. And we give the example of, in the book, of the um, Chilean rugby players who crashed in the Andes and uh, ended up eating the bodies of their family and friends to stay alive. First the flesh, and then when the flesh ran out, the organs, and finally the brains. And so appetite will make you do extraordinary things. Um, we also use uh, the example of the Ansel Keys refeeding trials in America uh, at the end of the war, where conscientious objectors uh, 
wanted to do something with the war effort, and so they volunteered for this trial of, of being starved and then working out how you could refeed people because um, they knew that that would be a problem in Europe towards the end of the war. And the, the testimonies of those people when they were starving are extraordinary. Everything else became not important. Um, and they, they report going to, going to the cinema, and in the cinema, you know, the train crashes, the car chases, the sex scenes or love scenes in those days, nothing mattered. But when food came on the screen, they were kind of like, that was what they were waiting for, the moment the film stars ate. And so clearly this isn't a, 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 a something you want to go wrong. This is a very powerful driver of human behaviour. And it makes us particularly seek out food that, is, that was rare when we rolled our appetite, that is high in, uh, highly calorie-dense, is high in sugar, salt and fat, and rewards us disproportionately in terms of pleasure for that food. We were talking earlier on, you know, people have done brain studies looking at, it's kind of some of those foods, the reward centres in the brain react in the same way that they do to crack cocaine, and you fill up more quickly, and over time, food companies have developed foods that particularly uh, attract those pleasure sensors. And so they spent more and more stuff researching, marketing this food. We've eaten more, they spent more, we've eaten more, and we've got sick. And it is not because they are bad people. They don't wake up every morning thinking, how do we kill our children? It's just because that is where the money is. And if we're going to break that cycle without... I mean, there are two ways you break that cycle, right? You either change appetite or you change the incentives in the food system. And unless you want to drug a third of the population with appetite-suppressing drugs, which actually is, I think, maybe the, the way we end up, and I think there are serious problems with that, you have to tackle the appetite. And then why, just briefly, why are we, as you're sorry, you have to tackle the, the commercial incentives mm. of the food companies. Why are we so bad? Um, you know, uh, we, we, have, we eat 57% ultra-processed food, 85% of which is unhealthy. Italy and France are down in the kind of mid-teens, mm -hmm. and Spain. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is that uh, we moved to the cities. We became uh, disconnected from our food supply much earlier than Europe. So uh, by the late 19th century, the percentage of people of our population we had in the city, France didn't re reach that until the 60s. So we, through the Industrial Revolution, took people out of the fields to make cloth, and we sold that to the world, and we bought our food in, and so we lost our food culture then. We, were, we would produce only 30% of our food before the Second World War. This, so, so there's a kind of food culture resisting that ultra-processed food is a big thing. Mm. The second thing is I think that the food cultures are created. So if you look at food cultures that have gone right, Japan, South Korea, France, and Spain, they have been very interventionist. We think of them as having these naturally uh, occurring food cultures. That isn't the case. They've been very interventionist, and we in this country are particularly fearful of doing anything to intervene. And the brilliant thing in your report, that's probably drawn from Dolly's work, that shows all of the kind of tiny little interventions that have been done to actually change this, we don't have much political courage. And just briefly on why it's sort of such an embedded problem. So one of the sort of stark things that comes through in the report is how it's become very closely aligned with, with inequality, so, so a sort of big gap between the richest areas and, and the poorest areas. Do you think that's a particular trend that we're seeing in the UK, or is that something that we, we see around the world as well? No, I mean, you, you see that around the world when society has got to a certain level of, of wealth. So if you are in developing countries, what you see is diabetes in the rich and uh, malnutrition in the poor. But in Western worlds, you basically see diet-related disease in everyone. I, I don't think we should know. If you look at it, there is a skew. But the richest decile are also really struggling. But there is a skew because, you know, for various reasons that we go into the book and that, you know, you talk about in the report, it is just harder if you are living in poverty mm. to, f to eat well. And you're also likely to be highly stressed and looking for simple rewards. So there's a kind of, it's harder to escape when you're in poverty. Brilliant. Um, Sophie, um, so Henry's mentioned that the report sort of looks at why, how successive governments have sort of tried to tackle this and, and why um, that hasn't worked. Can you summarise that and, and some of our recommendations? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Henry, for setting out the problem so clearly. Um, this is a challenge facing government, and uh, it's one government has identified it wants to act on 
you know, over the last three decades, there have been 14 different obesity strategies and 10 different targets on obesity. The government's missed every single one. Um, so, yeah, we set ourselves the question, why have past attempts not worked and what should government do moving forwards? Um, and as those of you familiar with the Institute will know, we kind of, to inform our research, spoke privately to a range of people from officials and politicians to experts, campaigners, food and drink industry. And thank you, many of you, for coming here today. Um, and they had a lot to say. <laughs> I think the first thing we learned very quickly is uh, chronic policy problems like obesity are very complicated. That's why it's become a long-term embedded problem in the first place. It's not to be underestimated. Um, I'm going to pick out a few of the things I found most interesting here. Um, our first conclusion, drawing on work from Dolly um, and others, is that most government policies over the last three decades, they focused on the wrong thing. Um, strategies were consistently aimed to reduce obesity primarily by nudging changes in individual behaviour. So whether that's through education about healthy diets, information campaigns, a five-a-day campaign, change for life campaign, many people have heard about, or introducing front-of-pack nutrition labelling. And these are all good things. So, you know, we don't know where obesity levels would be without them. And many people find them helpful. But by themselves, they've, they've proven insufficient to reverse trends against the scale of the problem uh, Henry's identified. Um, and it's easy to see why. They don't tackle rising obesity's real causes. Um, but they have been popular because these policies do match people's assumptions about obesity's causes, and they largely avoid the most thorny political com contentions around obesity policy. Debates about nanny statism, risks that policies would increase the cost of eating for those least able to afford it, and the hazardous terrain of government inter intervening in the food and drink industry. No government wants to be the government that killed off the biscuit business. It's much loved. <laughs> But there are also underlying issues with how obesity has been governed, which have contributed to successive strategies failing to reverse trends. Tackling obesity hasn't been a top priority. With the exception of Boris Johnson, and even then his commitment was short-lived, it hasn't been a priority within number 10, and it's not a top priority in any of the government departments. Even the Department of Health is overwhelmingly focused on the, uh, on the NHS rather than population health and prevention. And the capacity it does have focused on obesity and OHID doesn't hold many of the levers it needs to shape our food environments. You know, regulations on food are held within DEFRA. Advertising is held within DCS, and taxes are held within the Treasury. All of these departments have their own conflicting priorities. You know, DEFRA and DCMS see themselves as sponsors of the food and media industry, which leads to conflict when it comes to regulations to improve health. The relationship between the Department for Health and DEFRA seems to be particularly different, difficult. Um, DH sees DEFRA as too cosy of industry. Well, DEFRA Field DH don't properly understand the food industry and the pressures that has been under in recent years just to keep food on the shelves. As it stands, this is not an environment for effective collaboration on policy design and implementation. But with a proper strategy and government structures in place, the government could change course. Uh, our report sets out recommendations to help the government build consensus around more effective policies which do tackle what Henry has helpfully termed the junk food cycle. For instance, we recommend the government develops a better national conversation around obesity policy. Our research found the public are more supportive of government intervention than often thought, especially when it comes to tackling childhood obesity, where children are seen to have less choice in, their, in what they eat. Um, but the public do need policies to be well explained and framed. As long as they think obesity policy means telling them what to eat or taking away things they really enjoy, the success of communication is always going to be limited. We argue government should instead develop principles to communicate effectively about the causes of obesity, really explaining the rationale for government action under what circumstances and how responsibility should be shared between government, businesses, individuals, communities. We also recommend government reform to guide more effective policy-making processes. If the government is serious about tackling obesity, it needs to develop and implement a robust long-term strategy with long and medium-term targets backed up by analysis an advanced site of the critical dependencies meeting these targets will rely on, similar to what we have with the net zero transition. The strategies so far have not done this, resembling, as one expert described to this, a shopping list of policies that might help. Implementing this strategy would require well-coordinated, focused governments. And to support this, we recommend ministers establish a new cross-government food and health policy unit, jointly led by DHSC and DEFRA. With support from the centre and led by ministers who are advocates for effectively tackling obesity, this unit could better manage trade-offs and steward change in the food industry. We draw together the immense strengths of DHSC and DEFRA around a common mission. We also think that there is a role for stronger external scrutiny here too, via an independent annual assessment similar to what we have for climate change, 
and argue that we need to invest more in strengthening the evidence base on how policies work in practice. Now, there's a lot more analysis and recommendations in the report, which I would thoroughly recommend you read. Um, <laughs> it's on our website. Um, but I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Dolly, you've been in this area a long time um, and, and sort of done your own analysis of what's gone wrong. Um, what do you see as the sort of key barriers and what do you make of the IFG recommendations? Do you think they would, they would help or anything else you would, you would add to that list? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I mean, congratulations on the report. It's great to see something that really looks at the sort of political problem uh, of this issue and, and naming it a chronic policy failure is so important because that chronic aspect is absolutely definitive of this, of this issue. You know, over, over three de decades of failed policy on this area. And, you know, the same questions over you're asking in terms of, you know, how is it that we can have 30 years of government policy and yet no reduction in the uh, prevalence of obesity or any improvements in diet related ill health is just ludicrous to be in that position um, and sort of what that nightmare policy cycle looks like. So that's what led me to do uh, that analysis of all government obesity policies over the last 30 years, of which we've had almost 700. Um, and many of those uh, go through a, a depressing cycle of either never reaching implementation stage um, or repeatedly being proposed by multiple governments, sometimes implemented and then scrapped, uh, which we saw very recently with uh, the government introducing 100 million for weight management services only for almost a year later, completely scrapping that funding. So you're basically setting local authorities up to set up services that they then just don't get any funding to see through. So we're in this nightmare policy cycle and uh, with the Conservative government that's been in since 2015, uh, we've had four government strategies that have contained almost exactly the same policies and yet very few of them seeing, being seen through to implementation. And one very good example of that, that's a very recent one, is the uh, restrictions on unhealthy TV and online advertisements that was first uh, proposed seriously by um, or considered under Cameron and then he resigned before he could publish it and handed it over to Theresa May. So that was sort of that 2015 era government was seriously talking about this and then the current government has just postponed it or delayed it to 2025. So that will be 10 years for one policy that may or may not get implemented 10 years after, after being considered. So that's the kind of uh, delay on action that we're seeing. Um, in terms of the barriers, there are so many and so many really interesting ones, um, including the kind of political popularity of unhealthy food. So you often see whether it's the slightly unglamorous bacon butty being eaten, um, but pint pulling and being seen to be down with the people through unhealthy food. There's a really interesting sort of political relationship with, with food. Um, but I wanted to talk particularly about three uh, areas. So neoliberalism and the link with sort of uh, fears of uh, accusations of uh, nanny statism, which is what the report so brilliantly highlights. Uh, the low political prioritisation and why that is. Um, and then I want to talk about ultra-processed food, which Henry uh, talked about a bit earlier and, and that sort of uh, situation we're in in terms of the nature of the way food companies are operating and the types of food that they're uh, selling. So... Um, the report talks about the fear of nanny state accusations, and this relates to the very entrenched belief system and ideology that underpins the UK political system, which is neoliberalism. And you get various versions of it, depending on different governments, but essentially we function or operate within a neoliberal belief system. And that's the same for other countries like Australia, uh, Canada, US. Um, it uh, sort of emphasises mar market freedom, uh, as we know, minimum government intervention, self-governance by the individual, um, and an expanded role often, uh, more often than not, for market actors in all spheres of political, economic and social activity. So uh, that's the kind of um, uh, system in which we operate and it really focuses on the individual. So anytime we're talking about potential solutions to kind of chronic systemic issues, social issues are often resulting because of this belief system in individual focus responses to it. And there are multiple really interesting studies, anyone interested in looking at the academic literature on the barriers and facilitators to policy uh, movements in this agenda. Uh, Neoliberalism is a kind of core feature of the main barriers uh, in multiple uh, government settings across the world. And why doesn't this belief system uh, result in effective policies? Because it focuses on getting individuals to change their behaviour regardless regardless of how difficult the circumstances and regardless of how difficult companies make it. Um, and then it blames people as a result of that for failing to change. 
and getting people to change without making it easy by shaping the environment around us, um, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and it's, it's very, very hard, especially when it comes to food. So the type and scale of food that the food industry makes and the level at which it markets and sells that food over the last uh, 40 years has changed enormously. Um, again, Henry talking a bit about the kind of nature of the, of the food system and the food companies and, and the kind of um, uh, incentives that they operate in. They're really tapping into that uh, human desire for certain types of food and capitalizing upon it. Um, so we're now in a world where we're bombarded by unhealthy ultra-processed food pretty much wherever we go. Um, so whether you're at train stations, you're in school, you're in hospitals, you'll see vending machines more often than not than any fresh whole foods. Um, and then even in the advertising and what's marketed and promoted, uh, the balance is massively in favor of unhealthy um, ultra-processed food, which on top of being the most appealing, marketed, branded, available, is also cheaper. So we know that per calorie unhealthy food is three times cheaper than, un, uh, than healthy uh, foods. And we've got some examples of the research in terms of those uh, disproportionate um, uh, bombardment in terms of advertising. So during the peak hours when children are watching television, you've got um, almost 60% in some cases and more in other cases of food adverts being unhealthy. Um, and we know that the research uh, shows that this leads directly to an increased uh, consumption of those foods, which as we usually summarize, of course, companies wouldn't advertise if it didn't work. Why would they spend millions doing that? Um, and so when the balance of what food is made available, appealing, convenient and cheap is massively in favor of the unhealthy food, it plays that starring role in our minds. So even if we have healthy options uh, there, uh, it's still so heavily skewed towards that unhealthy option. And so that is why we have 64% of adults uh, currently living with obesity and overweight and one in three children uh, the same. Um, it is a totally normal response to the environment that we live in. So when we blame individuals for not being able to do anything to change it, and you look at the stats being in the majority of adults, it is a totally normal response to the food environment that we live in. And the global burden of disease, um, which is one of the sort of major studies in this area, uh, shows that diet-related disease is the leading cause of early death and is linked to more deaths globally than tobacco, high blood pressure, infection, or any other health risks, 22% of, of all deaths. So when it comes to government policy on this, and we're functioning this in this neoliberal paradigm where we focus on the individual, the more effective policies that would be aimed at shaping and rebalancing that environment to make it easy for everyone, regardless of circumstance, to eat well, um, you're just not seeing those policies because it's focusing on still getting individuals to change their behavior within a very, very challenging environment. And I talk about this as a kind of nightmare you know, particularly for low-income families, and you were talking about the inequality side of things, the reason why this embeds inequalities and makes it much harder is because who can change in, an, in a very difficult environment? Those with the resource, those with the money, those with the time, those with the opportunity, whether that's because of where they live or uh, the freedom they're not facing, uh, multiple burdens related to poverty. The people that can change are those with greater resource, and the people that can't change um, are obviously, the cards are completely stacked against them and in some places we're literally talking about people who cannot afford to eat purchase the healthy food even when it's available let alone having maybe even the housing circumstances to cook food uh, and prepare it and, and all the rest of it or even to we know that the food foundation has done some brilliant research on um on how you just don't have the uh, budget bandwidth to test out new foods and have your children try new things and reject it because you literally have that one opportunity to feed them and you want them to have something that they're going to eat as well. Um, so that is why the, in the uh, analysis that I did of all government policies, the largest proportion were highly agentic policies. So they really demanded a lot from the individual to change their behavior. And so when you see another government um, information campaign that sort of says, you know, let's change and eat less, move more, it does nothing other than embed the blame culture on individuals, increase those inequalities between people who can afford to fight, literally fight their environment um, versus those who can't afford it. And then very quickly on the low political prioritization 
We did some research last year that was really interesting in talking to SPADs, uh, special advisors, um, politicians, um, some former health, uh, public health ministers, and those other people in Westminster, and asking who in Westminster do you see leading on this, championing this? And other than Jamie Oliver and Henry, uh, we had no one named. So there are no, even with the amazing people like Lord Bethel in the room who uh, talk about this relentlessly and are campaigning relentlessly, it is not being received. So there is sort of, there's a low prioritization with this uh, issue. And I sort of want to say the positive, which is that that is an amazing gap to be filled. So if we can have people across think tanks, the civil service, politicians themselves, champions outside of Westminster, to be making this their thing, because it affects every single one of us. It is now the majority of us that are affected by the food system that we live in and will be resulting in the kind of diseases we get and the deaths as well. And then finally on ultra-processed food, which again, I was thrilled that the report touched upon, we are in a very exciting year for this agenda because the current way that we define food is focused on the HFSS model, so high foods that are high in fat, salt, sugar. That's how we um, categorize what are unhealthy and healthy products. And yet we're seeing this rise in evidence on ultra-processed food, which um, is a huge chapter in Henry's book, which I'm championing myself <laughs> here um, and absolutely must read. But we're learning that the way that food is processed plays a massive role in uh, diet-related ill health as well. So we've had randomized control trials, and there's another one in the pipeline at the moment um, on, on UK citizens, which I'm very excited about seeing what happens. But um, comparisons between the same um, uh, uh, diets in terms of their nutrients, so two diets matched for the nutrients in terms of calories, fat, salt, sugar levels, but one being an ultra-processed uh, diet and one being a more whole food diet. And what they saw was that the people on the ultra-processed food diet ate 500 calories more per day. And these types of foods you can recognize, because I know it's a new term for, for lots of people, you can recognize them by being largely marketed branded foods that are wrapped in plastic and with an ingredients list containing things that you wouldn't otherwise find in your kitchen. And it makes up, as Henry said, 60% of the UK diet. It is, it is our national diet. And uh, children and one in five people, it is 80% of our, of our national diet. And we know that it leads to increased consumption because of these are sort of some of the mechanisms. It's soft. Um, so even when you've got sort of crispy chicken or whatever, we know that the composition of this it is, it actually is soft, so you can consume much more uh, quickly. It is highly marketed and branded, so you, it is literally designed to make you eat and crave more, um, marketed for you to finish that packet, um, uh, and, and then it's available everywhere, and it's super cheap, and that is, that is why it has become the dominant diet. So... We haven't yet got a government that recognises uh, ultra-processed food formally and hasn't integrated it into the dietary guidelines and recognised that role that it plays. And we have seen that in other countries abroad. So France, for example, Brazil, are integrating ultra-processed food um, into their national dietary guidelines. And what will be very exciting this year is uh, Henry's book highlights ultra-processed food, and we've got uh, Dr. Chris Van Tulliken's book coming out next week, which is on ultra-processed food, um, will be what, that, what the government does in response to that and how that really affects the nature of how we uh, regulate the foods that are uh, available to us today and the ones that are most dominant in our minds. Dolly, thank you for that. That's really, really clear. Um, just before I open it up for questions, Henry, I wanted to give you a chance to, to sort of come back on what Sophie and, and Dolly have set out, and in particular, I suppose, on, on some of the recommendations for change. What are your reflections a couple of years on from, you know, you published the National Food Strategy, uh, and you've also seen inside government sort of how things, some of these things move or, or don't move? So I think that the, 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 the key thing in the report for me was the recognition that this is going to be a multi-term problem. And actually, if politics continues as it is at the moment, within a term, you might have multiple administrations. And if you have long-term systemic problems uh, where two things, first of all, some of the actions required to tackle them might be politically difficult. Secondly, because it's a complex system, some of the actions might not work. So if you look, for example, at the sugary drinks industry levy. It took a lot of sugar out of sugary drinks, but I was contacted during the writing of the strategy by a sugary drinks company arguing strongly that 
it be applied to all sugars? And I was like, why are they doing that? And my strong hunch is that it's a complex system. You've taken sugar out of one part of it, and sweets and biscuits and cake have taken share from the sugar in, in soft drinks. So it's difficult, and you have to, there'll be a bit of trial and error. So politically, that is the worst possible kind of problem. And that is why I think the, the biggest issue is, you know, if we look at climate change, it's a similar thing. Mm. And so for me, having some yearly report, having such a targets and a yearly reporting back to government helps you create the momentum to take it across multiple uh, administrations. Mm. The second thing I think fundamentally anyone involving here in, po in, uh, in this and in campaigning or helping governments think about policy is what are the things that we want all parties to have in their manifestos? I don't think anything serious is going to happen on this. I mean, it might. People are quite frightened. Politicians are really scared by the diabetes news. But I don't think anything's going to happen until after the election because it's the kind of stuff that you need to have a plan for and then move when you've got the political capital. So what are the things that you want both parties to have in their manifestos. Restricting advertising has to be one of them. And the, uh, the second thing on that is, I hear way too many people talking about, uh, how, what are we going to get into Labour's manifesto? Labour's manifesto, it's a long way until the next election. We need to be focusing on all parties, because anything could happen. So we need to create, as with climate change, a, a, a national sense that this is a problem and a national need for all parties to put stuff in the manifesto. Just on the manifestos, we might not see sort of really detailed commitment to, to policy, as you say. Do you think we might hope for, in some of, some of the overarching targets, some things that a bit more specifically align with population health? It's interesting if you, if you take Labour's, for example, that they're very focused on you know, the NHS and it's sort of is it, is it fit for the future rather than sort of some of these wider challenges? Well, I, I think at, at the broader issue... So, first of all, I wouldn't give up on specific policy. So, for example, I mean, it didn't happen, but the, 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 uh, the Tory government made a very specific um, uh, commitment on trade, and they wouldn't do trade deals that would allow food to come into... Uh, that was of low quality. They actually reneged on that thing. But I wouldn't be getting advertising in there. I think that the, the, the tone change we need on prevention is... It's, it was really interesting. Steve Barclay, in his kind of reports, talked a lot about prevention. What he was talking about wasn't prevention at all. It was early diagnosis. So how do we use AI, more data, to diagnose people early so that we treat them early before their problems get worse? Mm. We actually need to think about, to Andy Haldane's point, how do we have create a, a healthier population before diagnosis, so a healthier food system? And I think that is for both parties. And I, you know, to Dolly's point as well, you know, I, I spoke to a Labour MP uh, who's very uh, interested in this area, and I said, how much do you think the red wall and the perception that you don't want to be nanny state and that Labour doesn't want to be seen, be able to be characterised as being nanny state or anti the working man plays into this? And she said she thinks it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And so pointing out that actually they're wrong. So if you look at... I'm about to put the, 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 um, the focus groups and the quant research that we did, and I'll give you the link, uh, on our website. If you look at that, there are some things that are no-go areas. Meat is really difficult. You would, you would lose a lot of votes if you started to be vocal about even saying people need to eat less meat. But on things like restricting adverts to children, it is a, it is a complete no-brainer from a, for, you know, it's absolutely overwhelming support for that. So I think we need to change... Get, we need to tackle two things. One, the idea that prevention is about, in terms of ideas, one, the idea of that prevention is about early diagnosis, and the second is um, the idea that this is incredibly unpopular stuff. It's not. People are fed up. Brilliant. Okay, I'll open it up for questions there. I've got some to bring in from online as well. I'll take two down the front here from this lady and this gentleman, uh, and then one here from Lord Bethel. If you can say who you are and where you're from, keep them relatively short. Um, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, Jeanette Corker, unemployed. Um, I, I haven't really got a question. I was just saying that I think we should all have free gym pass, a basic free gym pass. 
Chris Myers from The Times. I mean, Henry, you made brief reference to the idea of these new generation of weight loss drugs, which is really a focus in the Department of Health at the moment. Steve Barkley is very interested in their drawing up plans, as you say, to give, you know, potentially give them to millions of, of people if the contracts allow. Can you just elaborate on, on where you see that, you know, being helpful, beneficial, dangerous, and what the, what the issues are there? And then I suppose following up to that, you talked about if, if you can't change appetite, you have to change incentives. Given, you know, uh, what we want and the, how po politicians and companies respond to consumer demand, to do that, do you ultimately have to change the food culture of the, you know, this country? I mean, Paul Susan Jeb got into a lot of trouble for saying we shouldn't take cake into the office, but is this going to change until it is, you know, unacceptable, you know, as unthinkable as offering around a packet of Marlboro Lights or whatever, and are there any lessons we can learn from those places like South Korea and Japan? You mentioned about how little government interventions can change that culture. Thanks, Chris. I'll take one more here. Sure, no. Just the mic's coming over. Do you want to do those and then? Uh... Yeah, OK. Um, Henry, shall we start with you? Uh, yeah. If you want to pick up Wagovi this one directly. So on Wagovi, um, we have two, two chapters back to back in the book, Hacking the System, which is about what you do on changing the inst commercial incentives of companies, and then Hacking the Body. And we did a lot of work on, uh, on Wagovi. I spoke to quite a few people who, who were on it. And in the, you know, I, I like to think about the current system as, as being a swamp. And some of us have genes that are better suited to live in a swamp than others. And for those that have... Uh, genes that aren't suited to live in a swamp, we should t still teach them swamp craft, right? So there is a, you know, you should recognise that it's a problematic system, but that you shouldn't give up on t training people, helping people live in this difficult environment. If you have a BMI of over 35, and all your life you have, it's had a psychological drain and physical drain from struggling with your weight, I would strongly recommend you, and, and, and health problems, I'd strongly recommend you go and talk to your GP. The woman I spoke to in the book said, look, we live in a depressing world, and it's not considered a bad thing to take antidepressants. Why shouldn't I have this? And I, you know, that is great. And funny enough, with Govi, semaglutide is the first of, it's the Prozac of these drugs. So there are at least five I know of that are in development, and there'll be more. However... I think there are two huge problems with, you know, 12 million people was the, with the, in the papers reported that 12 million people on drugs could be up to 30% of the population. And there are two problems. One is, as we saw with the COVID vaccine, that um, if you give a drug which in trials to thousands of people has proven safe to millions of people, you will almost always have some tail effects that on a population level are quite low risk but they become the news story. They meet people frightened of the drug, and people who really want, should be taking the drug, don't, because they get scared. And I think that is a huge concern with rolling this out very quickly. The second thing is that um, we, we, in, in complex systems, we have seen time and time again that if you try and fix one thing, Almost inevitably, other things, the system moves to make other things go wrong. And I have a deep concern that if you just try to drug your way out of the problem, something will occur down the line. There was a really interesting study in the States that's just coming out that shows that it might be that actually people losing weight on Mugobi, quite a lot of them are losing a lot of, not the fat, but are losing a lot of their other body weights. There are all sorts of concerns. I just think it is a very reckless way to go. So how do you change culture? Uh, which is your second point. Uh, there, there are the kind of there are the interventions in the you know restricting advertising, sugar and salt reformulation tax, but fundamentally those will make the bad stuff slightly better. How do you create a culture where we're eating the good stuff? And we use again in the book we use the example of Japan, where people think of Japan as a kind of God-given perfect food culture. But it is completely a creation of the state. So at the, at the end of the major restoration, when Japan, at the end of the 19th century, when Japan opened up, they first, the Dutch first arrived because the Dutch would stand on their, but they were the only people who'd stand on their Bibles when they did trade deals because they're very practical people. And so the Japanese didn't, didn't like the Christians. So they got the Dutch in to stand on their Bibles uh, and the Chinese. And the, the Japanese were in awe of the size of these people. And they were kind of puny. So the emperor decided, OK, we need to get bigger. And 
he launched a program. First of all, he started eating red meat publicly, which was taboo. He launched a program in the army where he got the army to create a whole bunch of dishes. The army, army chefs working with doctors create dishes that would beef up the army people. And things like katsu curry, for example, was copied from a, a which is now kind of seen as archetypal Japanese dish, was copied from a, a dish that was served on British naval boats, uh, fried chicken with a curry sauce that we got from India. Uh, and so they did this huge, event, and then they, they get the army chefs to go on the radio to speak to the public and speak to housewives that had demonstrations. And th that was the kind of first complete change in their culture. And then again, when MacArthur came in after the war, again they were struggling. And MacArthur created a whole series of recipes, and they did things like the delicious Japanese mayonnaise that you have, that's strange delicious, was created with twice the amount of egg that normal mayonnaise has, because they needed protein intake. And so what you think of as a, uh, and things like the tea, even the tea ceremony, there's certain things that were like, uh, actually, if you look at the tea ceremony, the stories about it are hugely more since Second World War, because they intentionally took that, because they thought it created care for food, etc., etc. Et so you can intervene. Now, in Japan, intervention that would seem anathema here, they have the Metabo law, they have fantastic school meal for kids, Everyone gets measured by their companies. And if you are uh, over a certain weight, you get put on a weight management course. You get given the opportunity to go on a weight management course. Finland did a similar thing. South Korea did a similar thing. You have to intervene in multiple areas. But culture change is possible. If you, there's a, there was, a, there was a, um, a, a tweet going around, occasionally goes around on Twitter, with what the Japanese think about other people in the world. And uh, against D D Denmark, it says, always happy, and against France, it says no thin pe no fat people, and against the UK, it says bad food. That's what the Japanese, and that's not true anymore. So we have already had a cultural renaissance. We now have better food uh, in London than they do in Paris, miles better. I was sent there as a journalist uh, way back when, asked to come off, when, when the eagle and quaggly nose, and we'd just begun to get a food culture and uh, a sent to kind of compare the food, and Paris is much worse. And I went back and did the same trip recently, and we're better. So you can change food culture. We need to get away from this nihilistic view that we are doomed forever to be sausage roll eating fatties, because otherwise we'll just end up uh, miserable and impoverished, and that isn't a future that any government should be, should be a, their vision for the country. It's just Thank completely... Hopeless. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. You have uh, comprehensively answered the uh, online commenter who said, can Henry offer some examples from Japan? Uh, so, so they've got their question answered. Sophie, I wonder if you could pick up the, the first question on uh, free gym passes. We've had another question online about should we see obesity just as a, as a diet-related issue alone? Does that feel a bit too narrow? If you could talk about the balance. Mm, absolutely. I think one of the things I found really interesting coming into this research was I was totally unaware that... So physical activity is fantastic for our health. Like it's brilliant for us in so many different ways. Um, but when it comes to weight, it's much less important than diet. Um, there's been many, many studies, and all of them have found that um, while physical activity has some role in helping you um, keep weight off after you've, after you've lost weight and it's preventing weight regain, that's basically the limit of its role. And if you really want to... Uh, lose weight substantially, it is the diet part of that has to change. Um, and it's interesting because I think a policy like free gym passes, no one's going to argue that's a bad thing. Like that's, you know, that's something that is going to be helpful for health and we do need to think about health ultimately. Um, but I think it does come back into this kind of, that's very much the area within which policy discussions happen. That's kind of the framing that we've been talking about. Kind of, it comes back to this idea of giving individuals the opportunity to um, choose to go to the gym um, and while that's great that's not changing any of these wider factors that are so powerfully affecting diets and um, if I might just elaborate on um, we had a really interesting conversation talking about local government action on this as well um, and a leader in local government on this um, said that they found it a lot easier to uh, focus their interventions on physical activity than on diet within local government and um, that's a, a, it's kind of politically easier, you know, it's, it's popular, it's, it's less than any state, kind of, and they, they kind of have the, uh, the infrastructure there, they can closely work with leisure centres and things, so it is there and that's a good thing, but there's been 
a real this lack of this kind of national mission around changing diet and around you know this kind of political consensus and uh, momentum that matches the scale of the issue um, has meant they said that the vast majority of their public health focuses within a government were focused on physical activity instead of diet when we know it's actually the latter that is likely to have a, a greater impact when it comes to, to weight and diet-related health. Brilliant. And Dolly, I might get you to pick up on the, the culture point. Mm. Uh, we've had another question online from Gwen Nightingale from the Health Foundation who's sort of asking what can be done to influence and change the accepted narrative here. I think we had someone in the report describing it as, as sort of akin to, to turning a cultural super tanker. I mean, you were describing in your opening comments just how embedded some of these things are. Mm. And I suppose one interesting part of that is the public attitudes, because people are at the same time actually very supportive of measures like the sugar tax and advertising bans and so on, but they do still default to this quite individualist yeah. framing. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the report, again, was brilliant uh, um, in the kind of talking about the importance of framing and the sort of communication and that recommendation I'm really interested in because if government did um, sort of come together and talk and, and engage with institutions like the Frameworks Institute that helps um, uh, organisations frame issues in a way that's more likely to lead to those effective policy measures, then it would be fascinating to see what kind of campaign they would make. And this is exactly as you're saying, so the, the, the uh, public popularity is not really the problem. And we know from uh, the research that was done uh, and polling and, and qualitative research was, that was done around the national food strategy, just how popular these interventions are. In fact, the only one that sort of wasn't popular was, uh, was around the meat tax, but basically everything else, people want government intervention on this. So it isn't a public popularity problem it is a political popularity problem and again that's what the report is so brilliant at uh, focusing on and there are lots of reasons for that and one one is the kind of often negative framing of this agenda so you often hear with it with public health interventions it's about taking stuff away banning what we like and that kind of agenda that kind of framing isn't necessarily helpful when it's um a politician that's trying to win people over or win the argument over to their colleagues because they want to be seeing, seen to be making things better and improving people's lives, uh, making it more enjoyable or whatever it is. And when it comes to food, that is a very, very long-standing um, issue in terms of government intervention on this agenda of being seen to be taking away things that people like. Um, so instead, trying to look at the positive framing, and, I, and I've been working on this for, for quite a long time now and um, particularly loved the piece that William Hague, Lord William Hague, published last year in May um, on obesity because he completely reframed the issue and very cleverly using concepts of freedom. So the freedom to choose is often something you get lobbed back, you know, shouldn't we just have the freedom to choose what we eat? And instead he talked about good health being the ultimate freedom. And he talked about how we needed intervention to en enable people, everyone, to live freer lives by being in a, in a better state of health. So there's some very interesting work around how to make it more politically appealing across the board and Labour's having exactly the same problem with not wanting to be seen to be hiking prices up. So even when you've got policies like the recommendation on the salt and sugar tax in the national food strategy, which is actually about making food more accessible and affordable and providing it for low-income families, any sense of a word of tax around and it sounds like you're putting the prices up. So we're up against this sort of narrative around associations with certain policies that also are just fundamentally misunderstood. So even when you're trying to actively make food more accessible and affordable, healthy food more accessible and affordable through interventions like a fiscal lever or um, reducing the promotions um, on unhealthy products and making it so that the attention is on healthy products, these can be still interpreted as things that hike the prices up and take away choice. So there is that kind of problem that we have to overcome and frameworks has looked into what is politically appealing. So they have that research and we know that difference between places as a narrative rather than difference, differences between people is more politically popular. So if we talk about how it's just not okay that we live in a country where where you live can massively dictate uh, the, uh, your life expectancy and the, um, the health that you enjoy throughout your life. And then on top of that, some of the Labour, this is more of a Labour Party problem, um, but you see it across the board, is that we have a food-centric approach to, especially when it comes to food security. So even by definition, food security means access to nutritious food, not any food, not food that's harmful to our health. Food security is by definition access to nutritious food. We still have this food-centric narrative around this, which means any access to food, if you just give people food, it doesn't matter what's in the food banks, as 
as long as food is there, then that's good. And overcoming that and making sure that the nutrition aspect is central in any policy around food and sustainability, because of course, this is just as much a sustainability issue as it is a, as a public health issue. And um, kind of how we create that culture change is a really interesting question, partly because there's often comparisons with tobacco on the health side, but also to climate. You know, how do we make the movement happen like it's happened in climate? And we just haven't seen that. And that's partly because we lack those policy champions. The few that we have are keeping going strong, but we need more of them. Um, and we need to make it po a positive. We need it to be a positive narrative that's about health being uh, the foundation of freedom for all of us. Um, it should be easy to be healthy. It should be crazy to us that it's, it's easier to be unhealthy than it is to be healthy in the current day and age. So how can we make that aspirational, politically appealing, and something that we want uh, that's a kind of election winning, legacy building issue? Brilliant. I've got two more questions in the room, and I'll take another one, the lady there as well. So I'll go to Lord Bethel, gentleman there who caught my eye. OK, let's take four. I'll take you as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll go for quick, quick answers. Yeah. Um, uh, my question is, is really the political sort of nitty gritty of it all. Um, so I thought you put it very well. So first of all, if you are trying to be a political champion for this agenda, there are three things that are, that are problematic. One is what I would call confidence, and I think you called it mission. It's sort of roughly the same thing. There isn't a feeling at the moment that even if we did these things, that actually the world would change. Now, that is deliberately um, encouraged by the industry, by opponents. There are vested interests. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, there are vested interests who are deliberately sledging our message and trying to create the impression that all of these interventions are pointless and counterproductive and beside the point. So, so we're, in an, we're in an adverse environment. But what can we do to try to create um, what Tony Robbins would call a visualization, that sense of you know, a Britain in the future that is a better place. Not quite like California, not quite like Tokyo, but mm. better. Um, uh, so that's number one, because that would make my life a lot easier. Limit of one question, I'm afraid. We've got, we've got four to get through, so I've only got ten minutes. You can pick them up afterwards. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask the best question first. <laughs> I'll take the lady behind and then two more over there. Hi, um, <clears throat> Izzy Pukuk from Ferrero. So, uh, yeah, from industry. Um, my question is for Henry. Um, Henry, you said that you'd been approached by an individual in the soft drinks industry following the, the SIDL, um, who speculated, or, or yourself speculated, I'm not entirely sure, that well. the share of sugar that had fallen from soft drinks had gone into cakes, biscuits, there's no proof for that. And in fact, we have representatives from the FDF here who will tell you across industry we have reduced sugar levels exponentially. Unfortunately, the exact figures do escape me. I think not only that, but consumption of these products has fallen. And, and I can point you to a graph that Chris Whitty kindly shared with industry last year. So I think um, my question is sort of, firstly, would you be able to share... Uh, your insights into where this speculation came from. Um, and secondly, um, well, no, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Court, okay. just the one question. Thank you for that. Two more at the back there. If, if you can keep them short and sharp, that'd be great. Thank you. James Kidner, from, formerly from the Foreign Office, now from Farming. Um, riveting discussion, and thank you. It's clearly a really important issue. And if we present it as a drama, I'm seeing the villain who you're being rather careful not to name as the food industry, um, and government ineffectually standing on the margins. And as Dolly says, all of us, in a sense, unwilling bystanders to this. This agency question. The food industry and the supermarkets and so on will say that they have tried and they've tried again. And we've seen the embarrassment that they face when they try to sell stuff that is healthier um, and people still go for the cheaper stuff. Can you give us some, uh, what I would call a, a sympathetic anecdata about ways in which they have tried things that work and conversely where they cynically are trying things that don't work but make them fatter? Okay, we'll take you briefly. Um, I'm Naomi Eisenstadt. I'm chair of an integrated care board for the NHS, but my background is early years in poverty. I, I, I'm making a plea because every room that I'm in, if you're in the poverty world, if I'm in an education room, it's about poverty and poor educational outcomes. If I'm in a health room, it's about poor health outcomes and poverty. My plea is in your throat clearing, talk about inequality itself. 
because in the book that Carrie Oppenheim and I wrote, Parents, Poverty, and the State, we made exactly the same arguments about, you know, the government wants everybody to read to their three-year-old, but, but takes away their benefits. So the relationship between inequality and overall poor outcomes is part of this story. And I would like you to stress that more. OK, thank you for that. Dolly, I'll, I'll start with you on those. We've got about five minutes left. So if you can sort of pick out a couple of highlights. Yeah, I'll pick out uh, the gentleman in, in terms of asking on the supermarket side. Um, it's really interesting because I was having a conversation yesterday with someone who was very opposed to, to intervention on this agenda and is now out of government and in a situation of um, potentially looking at this in other guises. And we were having a fascinating discussion because he said, isn't it about personal responsibility? And aren't, you know, things have been tried exactly as you're saying, and shouldn't it be uh, about the individual? And, and I said, in terms of the interventions that we need, you need both. You need the reduction in in the bombardment of unhealthy products, but you, that can't just be it, um, because you have to then actively provide the um, healthier alternatives. And that rebalancing is often not a feature of the kind of food environment uh, changes that we see. You'll get sort of one or the other. So it might be an increased provision by supermarkets, whether that's promotions on certain products. But as long as you still have the bombardment of unhealthy products, it is not a, it's not a fair choice. And it's not really a real choice, because you'll still have issues related, as you say, on the poverty side. It's so important to, to emphasize that because when people say oh, we should have cooking lessons and you know get people to do more when you're in poverty and you you may not even have a kitchen you may not even have the facilities let alone facing the multiple challenges that i uh, touched upon previously so the kind of idea of this is is you have to understand the real challenges that people face and that means taking away that starring role of unhe unhealthy food or reducing it. it shouldn't be taking it away absolutely reducing it because we need to have um uh, I totally believe in, in having a proper proper choice throughout or proper options available to everyone throughout. But reducing that bombardment at the same time as leveraging uh, the provision, active provision of healthy alternatives. And I come back to the um, intervention uh, policy recommendation that Henry pushes on the salt and sugar tax because ignoring the sort of potential of it as a reformulation tool and thinking about it purely as a way to take the, um, uh, to raise money from unhealthy products and invest it proactively into the provision of healthy alternatives, particularly for low-income families, which is precisely how that recommendation is pitched, is what's needed. And so in convincing the, the chap I was speaking to yesterday, it was really trying to get that balance that any time you're talking about an intervention, it has to be focused on that rebalancing. And you cannot do one or the other. You have to do both. Thanks, Dolly. Sophie, do you want to pick up on the, the gentleman's point about the relationship with industry? Because I know that's something that came up quite a bit in the research. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I want to pick up on two points, really. I think the first is kind of the uh, what's worked side of it. Um, and we did find in our research that voluntary measures uh, with industry were really important that they were tried. It was a really good thing to try. Industry knows best how to reformulate products. Um, and it's important that government has a good relationship with industry in that respect. But so far, they haven't worked sufficiently. Um, so it brings the question of what to do moving forwards. And I think there needs to be a better, a more productive relationship between um, the government and industry. Uh, we found sort of problems going both ways. Um, we found that the uh, Department of Health really struggled with the intense lobbying they experienced, especially you know, people cited uh, kind of US-based multinationals where the UK government has less influence, um, you know, having a very powerful lobbying role that made it very difficult to make to have proper conversations about this and make tangible progress um, on the other side of things we had sort of talked to industry professionals who said yes they have some disagreements on the substance and policy um, but they were struggling to even get into a room to talk about to talk with the government about that um, and you know they suggested an, uh, a willingness to engage in that conversation um, but more than that, they kind of, separately to the substance issue, they talked more about once policy has been decided, once policy has been announced, what then the role of industry is. And I think there's, there's definitely room there for a more productive relationship. Um, for instance, you know, uh, there's been delays in the uh, policies announced in the 2020 strategy, uh, so things like the um, advertising ban and, the, and um, price promotion restrictions and... Um, Part of that has been 
uh, part of that has been industry asking for more time with the pressures that they've had, they faced with um, Brexit and COVID and issues with food supply, etc. Mm. But part of that has been a separate issue with government processes as well. And you know, these policies are complicated. The one thing industry really needs is certainty and advanced sight of the changes they're going to have to make. So they indicated a willingness once policy has been announced and is going to happen to work with government on how to make that work most effectively and how to do it in a way that is going to help them do it well. Mm. Um, it's things like knowing exactly what constitutes a store entrance and you know for each of the individual stores, convenience stores, supermarkets, like those are really key bits of information that industry really needs to know. And that is something that the government can actively help with. I think having a more open conversation and uh, more emphasis on the detail of policy can really help with that. Brilliant. Very, very, quickly do that very brief last word. You've got Ferrero Rocher and then Lord Bethel's gone, but I was thinking you could do us a, <laughs> In a, brief, a brief vision <laughs> um, of uh, 2030. Um, so, funny enough, they wrote to me again last week. Uh, and the first thing I will do is ask them if they mind me sharing, because I think it's a better discussion to be had publicly than privately. So I will ask them if they mind me sending it on to Steve Barclay and sending it to you. Um, the, the, the thing about sugar, my feeling was, and it wasn't in their letters, they didn't give a reason why they thought this should be done, and it was me, was why are they so... And the fact they've written twice, why are they writing this? And I would love to see, if you have it, data on not only sugar but high glycemic foods. So I'd like to see what's happened to sugar, cornstarch, refined flour... And if that's gone down, that's fascinating. Please send me that data. At the same time, will you let me know what you think the solutions are? And if they are exercise and education, tell me why you think the arguments that I made against those aren't right. Right now? No, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> send me an email. Yeah, and I will ask them if I can send you their email. OK, brilliant. Well, that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you very much to everyone for coming. Sorry I didn't get to all of your questions. Do stick around for a chat and a, and a cup of tea outside. Um, we will be doing lots more work in this area, for, area, so do watch out for that. But just remains for us to say thanks very much to the panel. Great. Thank you.